Thank you so much, Rhonda. And this brings us on to the next part of the proceedings, which is our James, um, sorry, not our James Smart, that was last night. Um, this is our Nick Fife lecture. Um, our inaugural uh, Nick Fife lecture we introduced in 2019, which uh, was our last conference because we haven't been able to have uh, an event like this for the last um, couple of years. Obviously, uh, Nick Fife will be very familiar to you all. Um, he was here yesterday. He does send his apologies that he was unable. He really wanted to be here today as well, but he had to go and attend um, to other duties. So he would have been uh, presenting um, a, and introducing uh, Catherine, um, but he's, he's unable to do so today. Um, the Nick Fife lecture is really important to us. Um, it it acknowledges the work that Nick Fife did in establishing Cyper 15 years ago. And um, you know, as the, the next director after Nick, I've, I've done my best to continue um, the legacy of Cyper and to build um, on its strong roots. We do a lot in terms of research, knowledge exchange, learning and innovation, and partnerships. Uh, we're a small team. Um, there's always more we can do. Uh, but we believe that we, we punch above our weight, if you like, in terms of what we managed to achieve for quite a small uh, team. And for that, I'm very grateful to the, the leadership team, the four associate directors who I work with, to Monica, who is the, the engine, the, the powerhouse behind it all, and to everyone who's he, else who's helped with this, to our uh, postgraduate coordinators, Larissa um, and Simon, and to Denise for, for chairing uh, the conference. Um, the Nick Fife Lecture is important because we, we had the, the James Smart Memorial Lecture. Um, we, we found that we were interested in particularly involving um, pracademics, police officers, not just you know, pure academics, in, in, in taking some of those lectures. And indeed, that's what we did um, in 2019. Um, I think we had, a, we had a good speech yesterday from, from Andy Rhodes. And in 2019, we decided we would have the, the two lectures. So uh, this one could uh, potentially be a more academic one if we'd gone for a more uh, practitioner-based one uh, for the other one. So um, um, the um, guest speaker who we have today um, was decided on by the, the organizing committee. And I believe it's uh, true to the links that Nick um, has also developed with Norway and all the work, the comparative and, and collaborative work that he's done with Norway um, on reform, so it's an, a nice link there for us. And Catherine's work, you know, fits really nicely with um, with our theme today. Catherine is going to be talking about police leadership as practice, um, how to learn, lead, and innovate. Uh, Catherine is professor in, and this is very long, so bear with me. Professor in a lot of things. Professor in leadership um, and leadership development, organisational learning, change management, HRM. Or, and organisational behaviour at both uh, Police University College in Norway and uh, Christiana University uh, College. So without further ado, I will um, hand over to you, Catherine, and look forward to hearing uh, what you say. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's not really that I'm professor in all these things, <laughs> but actually I delivered what I was doing research on. And then ended up in the program that I was a professor in all these things. So, so that can be discussable. Uh, it's a great honor to, to be here, to be in Scotland, to learn about the Scottish police, but also a great honor to be invited to hold the Nick Fife uh, lecture. So I'll do my very best. The last couple of days, everyone has asked me, are you prepared for the lecture? And no pressure in the in next, uh, next line and sentence. So, so finally, now I can start to speak with, uh, with you guys, because I want to speak with you guys, not to you guys. I will try to my very best to come with the things that I've been working on, uh, actually starting from 25 years ago, uh, and then try to have some kind of interaction. It's very difficult when it's a lecture, but at the same time try to, to pinpoint a few things so you're able to reflect on what I'm saying here. And also, of course, hopefully, that is at least my, um, my goal for, for this lecture. Hopefully get some relation into your own work and how you proceed with your own, own work. So again, thank you so much for, for inviting me. And um, I'll try to start a bit on why I ended up with talking about police leadership as practice. And of course, uh, no pressure when it comes to talking about learning, talking about leading, and talking about innovating in 45 minutes. But I'll do, I'll do my very best to try to, 
see how these are connected. This is quite a puzzle, isn't it? So when I started in my academic life 25 years ago, my starting point was to figure out about learning, and especially talking about learning in organization. Because I started as a 19-year-old in my first full-time job. And so now the, the youngsters are better at this. They, they then take their education, then they start to, to build their family and stuff like that. I tried to do everything at once. So when I was 19, I started in my full-time job. No education after, after college at that time. I got three children in the middle of all this. Uh, and I was very lucky because I started to work at, uh, at the university, uh, in the administration at the university. So I was able then to, to do full, uh, part-time, sorry, part-time studies as I was working in, in the university. And I think that was, and why I share this with you, I think that was the starting point of why very much of my career in an academic world has been very much related to what is happening in practice. So when I started to explore and investigate and try to figure out about learning in organization, I was very much aware of that when I'm, well, I, my experience in the organization was that it's not so simple. It's not that you learn something from others and you store that kind of knowledge and then you use it for, for future situation. So at that point in my career, when I started on my PhD, I tried to figure out what someone has to know more about this learning stuff than just thinking about learning as something that happens outside the context that you actually are going to use the knowledge in, but also recognizing that where I learn the most is actually when I practice. And that is very important also when we talk about and talk with and talk to police. Is, yeah, but they will recognize that at once. We learn through doing the job that we are supposed to do. We learn by practicing. We learn by training. It's not that I go to this leadership course and then I can just say, okay, now I'm a good leader. I learn to be a leader every day. So the practice-based approach started when I then found my common colleagues at that point, uh, talking about situated learning, talking about learning through participation and practice, uh, talking about and using, for instance, Dewey with the thinking in action kind of thing so that you're able to not only start and go to work, but actually reflect on what you're doing in order to create some new knowledge, share some new knowledge, uh, and, so and so forth. So that was the starting point in my career. Sometimes I think it was quite challenging because it's much easier to say, okay, when you learn, you can go to a course and then people tell you this is a good idea and then you come back directly and then you can use it. It's much more complicated when we talk about learning as situated, as practice, that we have to reflect. But that is also the only way that we are able to grasp the complexity of being at work. The complexity that is increasing. You talked about complexity increasing for the last uh, 30 years, I think, but <laughs> it's still increasing, the complexity. But it's the danger then, when we see the increased complexity, the danger then is if you try to simplify what is actually going on. So when the title of this, this uh, lecture is learning, leading, innovating, it could be changing as well, it's part of the same story when we are in organization. And for me, the story has to start, and not only for me, I hope for you too, to, the story has to start with learning because it's the learning that we can facilitate for. It's the learning culture in the organization that we need in order then to, to innovate, to change, to change the practice from, from being where we are and to develop. And as far as we are able to do this as a more continuing processes, instead of saying now we need a reform because it's so huge that we have to change. But instead of thinking about learning as an ongoing process, because if I ask you, what did you learn at work today? Probably you say nothing. Because you end up with doing all this stuff and you can't really relate it to what you actually wanted to do and the challenge that you actually has, uh, had at work. But if you look at it as a continuing process, then it will be much easier for to say, okay, this is leading to something. When you finally get that article out, you would think that, okay, but why didn't I think about that? Why didn't I, be able, why wasn't I able to do that, do it in that way 
up to at an earlier stage. Yeah, bec it's because you need to be in this learning process all the time. So let me see if I'm able then to get you into this learning thing. Uh, I know that not all of you are working on learning. Some of you are maybe working on organizational learning. But that is also the basic. In order to, to try to grasp the practice, we have to, to make sure, I know as leaders also make sure, how can we facilitate for learning? How can we then develop a learning culture in the organization? Argerich and Schoen talked about this as single and double loop learning in 1991. Leiv and Wenger uh, talked about situated learning in 1991. But still we have quite some way to go in order to be able to grasp what is happening in practice when it comes to learning, when it comes to double loop learning, and when it comes to develop and learning the organization how to change, because then we have to look at the different practices. So, what is also the struggle with and the puzzle, or, or I remember one of the PhD students talking about the messy literature within most of the fields that we are working in, is that we have a tendency then to try to, 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 uh, to um, simplify what is happening in, in the organization. Instead of going in and say, what is context dependent? What is the context here? So that we can then relate it to what we actually are going to do, but also to think about how much of the learning that we, are, uh, that we are doing is related to other people. I have some knowledge on this, but it doesn't help me very much if I don't get people convinced that it is, this is a good idea. So the relation when we come to talk about learning, but also the relations related to the situation that we are going to solve. And also, again, related to what we are, are doing as a collective when we are in, in uh, an organization. Because very much of what we are talking about here, very much of the knowledge that we want to develop further is tacit in the organization. It's not that you can state that, say that, okay, but this is the knowledge that I have. And this is the knowledge that I can share with others. So that is also part of the complexity when we talk about what is happening in organizations and also related to how we can learn. That we need to be able to observe others. We need to be able to, pra to, to observe other practices. And we need to be able to practice together with our colleagues or other stakeholders in order then to, to try to grasp what is, going, what is going on. Just think about this pandemic now. What we ha have had to rely so much on, uh, on Zoom and on Teams and very much on the explicit language. What do we miss? We miss the informal kind of relations. We miss then pe seeing people what they actually do, seeing how people relate to each other seeing how people communicate, how they convince each other that this is a good idea. And that is the complexity when we talk about the practice in, in organization. So that is also the challenge in most of the literature that we find, is this dualism, instead of thinking about this as a dynamic. Being a good leader is not something that you are. It's something that you always have to be as a dynamic process. The dualism is, is um, hindering us because we are very much thinking about, uh, I'm learning individually, I'm learning uh, in, uh, in relation to, uh, to participation and, and uh, in practice. And when it comes to change processes, it's very much related to the strategies, and the strategies is, is stated here and there, instead of then thinking about the strategies and how you apply this in, in practice. So the dualism is, the biggest challenge that we have, have. And also when it comes to, for instance, when Dewey is talking about these things, thinking about thinking in action, that is a way to overcoming this dualism. Saying but that we have to have both. Instead of the cognitive people talking about the individual as the learning, and this, instead of sociologists and social anthropologists talking about learning through participation and learning in different cultures. So that is also the challenge when we Hopefully, and that is um, quite time consuming, but also a long, a long way to go, try to combine the two and also try to combine the different uh, disciplines, trying to work more interprofessionally also in, in organization. 
So this is what I'm trying to strive with for 25 years as my background within organizational learning. So if I've just ended up with one being professor in, that would probably be organizational learning. But it is very nice to, to have, have a lot of other things because learning has to lead to something. I hope you can agree upon me on that. It has to lead to something. But very often when I meet colleagues, they said, okay, learning's, of course learning is there. Yeah, but how is learning there? Nobody will be part of the process. And then they talk about strategies, they talk about innovation, they talk about other things, because that's more status in talking about innovation, isn't it, than talking about learning. So that, that can also be part. But maybe I'm, I'm a bit biased on that, coming from originally from a business school. So that can also be part of, uh, of this uh, trying to, to compete between uh, different, uh, different uh, professions. I like him, I love him, uh, Mars. He talked about this also. You can see a lot of things was happening in 1991 because most of the, re of the references that I use is actually from, from 1991. Still, I think it's very relevant. But he talked about exploitation and exploration of knowledge. And in, in his article for in organizational studies, that was related to organizational learning. But the way that we have used it and the way that he has developed it has also been related to innovation, related to change. And what if, when we look at this, the, trying to balance between exploitation and exploration of knowledge? That is the key of everything we do in order to change, in order to learn, in order to innovate. Because if we don't find any kind of balance so that we know that okay, so sometimes I need to be more on this exploitation. Sometimes I need to be more on exploration. But you have to be aware of that as part of the process. For instance, in the police reform. What is when? And also, the, I think the biggest challenge that we have in most organizations, at least I have to, to relate this to Norway, even though I've been in Scotland for a few days, I can't say it's related to, to the Scottish type of organizations. But even though that when we look at the different organizations, the, most, the biggest chance that we have is actually to take advantage of the knowledge that we already have in the organization. You agree? Not yet? <laughs> we'll, see. we'll see what happens. Yeah, because how educated do we need to be? How many courses do we need to have? How many trainings do the police need to have? Instead of thinking, how can we facilitate so that they, they, that they are actually able to use that knowledge in practice? And do they need some help? Or do they do it or informally? Or do they maybe change their work because they find another context, another type of organization which they actually feel that they can use the knowledge that they maybe have from, from education courses, stuff like that. So that is also part of that, that we tend to, when we talk about innovation, we tend to, when we talk about change processes, that we end up with just exploring something new. Good in initiatives, looks very good on paper, but very often not connected to what do these guys already know? What is in the practice? What kind of knowledge is there? Because that's more complicated to, to figure out, isn't it? And especially since most of that knowledge also is tacit. So it's easy to say, that, okay, but this is something that we want to explore further. And also when you're related to, uh, back to, to this balance again, where is the sense making in the organization? How do people make sense of a new initiative? Very often related to what they already can and know. So it's not that we are supposed to only explore and exploitate what we already can, but it's a starting point in order then to develop something further. And of course, very helpful when it comes to, to be able then to have some sense making of where am I, where am I developing to how do I have to work in relation to, to the new initiatives that very often come in most, in most organizations? And especially as when we talk about the Norwegian police. You have too many people sitting in the top with all these new initiatives, and especially politicians. They're very good at that. But the sense-making related to what the police already know, what they're good at. 
what they know is good policing. How can we relate to that when it comes to developing things, uh, things further? So, my research then, the last, uh, since 2015, uh, has been very much on the police. As you will know by now, when it comes to how I present this, is that I've been to a business school all this time. I ended up with being part of also the Police University College in 2015. And I will get you through, through the story of the Norwegian police, and then you will find out where I fit in, in relation to, to, to what was happening. So I know a lot about the Norwegian police. It's a lot about the Norwegian police I don't know. And that's for sure. So, but th that's also why I want to tell the story about the Norwegian police today. Uh, and of course, then, you're the ones that can relate this to, to the police other places and also in, in Scotland. Two uh, 22nd of, uh, of July 2011, we had a terrible incident in, uh, in Norway, in peaceful Norway which was always before that, people were saying, when, I, when people ask where you come from, say from Norway, oh, peaceful Norway. That was not very peaceful. But the, for those of you that don't remember, and it's, uh, it's a time back here now, um, it was a terrorist, a Norwegian terrorist, if you can call him, uh, call him that. He murdered, cold-bloodedly murdered, and now I get this <laughs> free thing yeah. every time when I talk about it. I'm, I'm not uh, going to cry, because, uh, but it's, it's heartbreaking. We had, a young, we had over 500 youngsters, which is then was a youngster in the Labour Party, up in this island. It's outside Oslo. It's, a, it's about uh, our, our drive from, from Oslo. And this island is... It looks like, when you see from, from a, a, a plane, it looks like an, a heart to make it even worse. But what he did is that he murdered, cold-bloodedly murdered, uh, 67 youngsters on that island. Dressed as a policeman, coming up to the, coming up to the island, and then, of course, getting the youngster to come, come and talk with them and stuff like that, and they cold-bloodedly cold murdered them. And then they had nowhere to escape. So the only thing that some of them were able to do was then to, to go into, into the water, and then, of course, some private boats were able to pick, pick them up. But 67 youngsters died out at, on the island that day. It started with then the government uh, parliament building first in Oslo, and there he, he, um, he had a bomb, uh, a bomb, so then he, he murdered uh, that will be around uh, 12 people there. And that's also why the youngsters, when they were, uh, were getting that on the news, and the policemen came out, they would thought that he was going to tell them about what was happening in Oslo as well. I'm not going to, because I see you get very sad, sad now, all, all of you, of course you get very sad, but this is a very important story when it comes to looking at the police reform in Norway. Because what was very quickly a turning point, because first we, we couldn't understand what was happening. None of us could. How can this happen? But after a few days, I don't think it was more than a few days, then it started to see, but why wasn't the police earlier out to help the youngster out on the on Utøya uh, yeah, is, is the name of, of the island. And so then going into with the roses, this is from the city center, going in with the roses um, in the, and uh, marching to, to actually celebrate love uh, instead of hate when it comes to this kind of, of uh, incident, they ended up with focusing more on but what, what, happened, what happened with the police. So instead of just, um, uh, I have to move forward, I see the, the clock is ticking. But what, is, what was happening here is that after that, and quite soon after that, they start to focus on the police. The healthcare, did that function, because I think that also that was more normal, because then of course people came into the office, uh, to the hospital, so that was more or less the way that they were trained. 
in how to handle this kind of, of huge uh, uh, incidents. But when it comes to the police, then of course it was in July, a lot of people were on holiday, and they didn't have the resources when you go, when you go um, one hour out of, of the city center too. So very early it started up, um, the police first started out to, to get some reports, to give some, uh, some statesmen on what was happening, why it took some, so long, long time before the police came out to Utøya. And then they also have this independent report. And the independent report was also the something that the government wanted to have. And it take, took one year before they gave uh, the results. And now we are at, uh, at uh, very much in the core of the police reform in Norway. Because what they were saying in that report was that even though saying that they only wanted to have uh, and, and go into what was happening that day in the report, even though they said, and their diagnosis was, that it was bad leadership culture and attitudes in the police. And in an academic world, if you read that report, you will fi probably find that a PhD student would be, would be, um, it would be the same amount of research as for one PhD student. So it wasn't any interviews as such. It's more, more like that they were just uh, out uh, asking people and also very, very much into who they were talking to. Uh, and also some of the informants there, which I've talked to, they felt very much pressured that it looks like the committee was very much focusing on what they wanted to have answer on instead of then getting a more overview on what was actually, actually happening. But that is quite a diagnosis, don't you think? Leadership culture and attitude, bad leadership culture and bad attitudes in the police as if they didn't want to, want to, to help people in, in need. That's where I was motivated. I be, have been to some leadership courses and held some leadership courses in the police uh, earlier, but then I thought, okay, I, when I read this report, I thought, okay, has someone actually tried to figure out what the leadership culture in the police is? So that was my starting point on my research. Uh, what we did first, and of course it's all, not only me that have done this research, what we did first was that we actually, in 2016, because that was just half a year after this report came out, we interviewed and observed police leaders. So that was the starting point. At that point, when we were looking at the leadership culture, if you could call it culture, what I would think we were looking at more like what the police leader actually do. Uh, but what we found is that it's not bad leadership culture in the police. I found it very recognizable with, uh, in other kind of organizations that I've been to earlier. Yeah, some good leaders, some very good leaders, some not so good leaders, very much what we will find in most types of, of organization. But what we found is that they didn't focus that much on leadership as such. But that's a different story, isn't it? So they used to leading each other, but, but that is more like Okay, I am responsible this, for these people in patrols and I'm used to leading them when we're out on the streets, for instance, or if, we, if you are in different kind of professions within the police. But they didn't focus that much on leadership as, as a subject or, or something about the leadership uh, training uh, related to general leadership instead of just leading within uh, investigation, leading within patrol, stuff like that. And I think that is very recognizable in most type of police organizations as, as, as such. You start your career as a leader to lead those that you were part of earlier, and then you, you make your career further up as, as, uh, in, in leadership. So that was the starting point. Of course, being quite critical to, to the uh, report for giving them uh, that kind of uh, diagnosis, but also we had the bunch of police leaders in the police say, saying, but can't, they say that we have a bad police culture, but could someone tell us what is wrong? Because that was also part of it, because they didn't have anything to hold on to. 
giving back, going back to Mars. And also the, the huge pressure on changing the learning culture, like the, the, the leadership culture in the police. And they didn't really have any idea on what to change from or what was good with the leadership that they already had. And what was also very often, which very often is the answer, is from the government, but also from the police directorate, is that a huge amount of leadership courses was facilitated. Also in, uh, in the police university college. And I would have been uh, one of those that actually have arranged this, uh, these courses. As the answer to something is wrong here, get people out of their everyday practice as leaders and put them in school and teach them how to, to lead, getting a lot of knowledge on leadership and all the different models within leadership, but nothing to facilitate them. How can they learn as leaders and facilitate how they, how they develop in, in practice? So my research started on, on that, but after that, I've started on and done, done a lot of research on the police reform. Because that was when we went into these 27 police leaders that we were following, that was the starting point on the reform. The reform in Norway started to be implemented then early 2016. And that means that when they started on, the, on that, they changed more or less everything in the police. It was centralized, which is very often the case in most police organizations. They, um, they changed also a lot of people, uh, leaders, uh, where they were leaders, were the new kind of leadership that they have to do, do when it comes to departments uh, that they have to lead, stuff like that. So it was a huge, 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 huge change in the, in the, the police. So that's also what we ended up with when we had this first round with police leaders. So that was also, of course, the motivation for going further on the implementation of the reform. And very often when you go into this reform, and also when, when I went into the reform, is that I ended up with, yeah, they were very good at this um, um, uh, chat, is that what you say when you have the show, uh, over the organization? You had a different uh, charge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were very good at that. And also the structure in the new organization. But other than that, how to work together, how to, to get the new, New, um, new, new leadership groups, the new geographical units to work, stuff like that. Then they were quite exhausted because it took over two years before they had the structure uh, there. So what was happening after that is more, has been more or less up to the police. And I think that's a good thing, actually, <laughs> because now I was talking to Nike uh, yesterday and it takes time and actually after this round now, and. The, now in 2022, this, it started to work much better because now they're more in the hands of the police trying then to figure out uh, how to work in the new organization. So that is also part of this picture, how long it takes. So that, but that is how I also do my research. And I think that's important when it comes to going into the practice is that you have to go to, to observe what they actually are doing. You have to see informally what, uh, well, how they relate to each other. You have to try to figure out what is this and why do they do as they do in the, in the organization. So that has also been part of, of the research. Actually just being that, see I'm a researcher from Police University College sitting back on the, uh, on the, in the car on, on patrol, sitting on the operations center uh, and, uh, and listening to, to the conversations, listening to the police in, uh, chief in leadership groups, stuff like that. That is where you find out what is this practice is all about. And of course, how they are quite different, but also at the same time, finding something that can be related to the police culture, for instance, or the police cultures, which Tom Cockroft would have said, which I totally agree that you have a lot of different culture, but within this, talking about this overall uh, police culture within, uh, within the organization. So what we found, uh, sorry about that, it has been swift, <laughs> swift a bit over. So what we found then, what police leaders do? Yeah, handle uncertainty, 
changes that comes, uh, comes along, trying to figure out this dilemma between what to deliver on, which then is very much related to, to uh, higher up in, uh, in uh, the organization or maybe to the police directorate. Tackling limited resources, sounds familiar. Looking good, try to, co to, to compete, and then also being very hands-on. As leaders, try to be as available as you can, encourage people, try to build up some collective thinking, try to be the culture within the, the department that you're responsible of. And what is also part of that is that when you have these more experienced leaders, is that they also say that, okay, if I've been more focused on that, or maybe if I have more help on that, I would probably tackle more conflicts earlier. Now I've been a police leader in 20 years. So now I finally go into the different conflicts, but it took me some time to be able to actually do that. So, so that's what they do. It's not very special. It's what most leaders do in most organizations. So what is then the need? And that is where this practice base is coming on. What is then the need for serving them with all these models? Which is then, of course, a big challenge in the leadership literature. This is only a few examples on the different models that we have within leadership. How does this relate to what is happening here? Of course, it can relate to that, but it depends. It depends on the situation. It depends on the context, and by God, it depends on what you actually are going to do. So what we were talking about yesterday, that sometimes they need to have this command control because it depends on what kind of, of uh, assignments that they are on. It's not a good idea to start to discuss when they're uh, with crisis management, they are out uh, as unseen uh, uh, commanders, for instance. So it depends, but that's also why they need to figure this out in relation to what they actually do, because here is the mastery. Here is where they are training. This is their everyday experience as leaders. How much they are able to reflect, how much they are able to reflect together with other leaders. Yeah, that depends. Some of them are very good at having maybe informal networks, using each other when it comes to knowledge sharing, for instance. And some are not so good. But very often then, when we talk about how to develop leaders, if we give them some models, which is by all means, it's not that I don't like leadership models at all, but when we, do, when we give them some language, when we give them some, some confidence, when it comes to what does the leadership literature say, because that's also where often what they want, and, so, and that they can relate to some of, that, or some of these things, then of course, it's also about giving the mastery, but also giving the self-confidence on what is happening here. So it doesn't fit, yeah, but that's okay because it's not supposed to fit. It's the way to, to simplify what is happening out there. And sometimes you talk about it as in its culture. Culture, sometimes you just talk about it as strategic, but sometimes it's also about, uh, as I said, back to, to Mars the balance on what kind of leadership is working, depending on what you actually are, are going to solve. And that is also the next thing here, is that when we look at what police leaders do, and it's not that what they do here is a good thing all the time. So it's from there it has to be developed, and it maybe has to change and further develop more dynamically. But that is also where they learn to lead. It's in this practice. And sometimes the contradictions, sometimes then maybe go in there first and see what kind of, of leadership models or routines or uh, guidelines do we need in order to think about policing in, uh, in, in this way, or police leadership in this way. Because what we also very often don't find in the leadership literature, that is the difference between the different leadership levels. Because all this leadership literature models is related to some expectations. Me as the one having a leader will have some expectation to my leader related to 
the leadership literature. But if that's not connected to what kind of leadership level you are on, that's probably why first-line managers think that, okay, we need to be so, a bit strategic here as well. So maybe I will have 10 minutes here to be strategic on my own or together with, with a colleague. But that's not the main purpose of that leadership level. So that is also part of that. Or maybe the other way around is very, very often the case in the police. That since they have gone through the same career starting as first-line managers, they can't really stop going into, going into to, uh, everyday practice. It's more difficult for them to let go and go up in the, in the hierarchy when it comes, to, it comes to leaders. At least that's something to, to reflect upon. And at least it's something that I find in, in, my, um, in my studies. That they tend to be more on, on ground, being one of, of the boys or the, or the girls, and very much the, the trust of them in them as leaders was very much to, to uh, relate to what have you done? What, what is your performance as a policeman or a policewoman? That is also part of, of the culture that we are, are talking, uh, talking about. Is that, does this make sense? Very cool. I, I thought that the Scottish people were uh, more <laughs> outspoken than this. <laughs> Do you have some time to reflect? <coughs> I hope so. At least I hope so. So why are we talking about leadership as practice? Of course, related to to, uh, to that we want to go into the practice, but also as a way of responding to that the critics of the leadership literature is very much related to, to that we, uh, we haven't taken the context into account. So that's why you find the same leadership model in China. And when you ask the Chinese people that, yeah, but the context on uh, what we are talking about here, yeah, but that's, uh, that's, that's not an issue. And of course, we know it's quite different to be a leader in China than be a leader in, in, uh, in Norway, for instance, which in Norway, we have very flat kind of type of, uh, of organization. And of course, will affect very much on what we expect of, of our leaders. So that is the starting point uh, on that, that we have to go into what is then the situation here, what is then the context that we, that we want to perform as leaders. So that is the starting point, but also this leader as something collective, leadership as something collective. Not just saying that I'm good at transformational leadership, because still we have the main focus on the leader. What we want to do within the leadership as practice is to say, okay, but one is responsible here, but it's more like to be, to be acknowledged as the member of the group. And I think this is extremely important also in the police. Because when we go back to the leadership models that I, I showed you on, on uh, earlier here, and we have new public management when it comes to the police. When we look at private organization, they are moving more and more forward. Of course, still many talks about transformational uh, leadership. I have to admit that. But in the police, but also as a result of new public management, you tend to adopt things maybe five or 10 years later. So what is happening the last year within this research, within this literature, stuff like that, it tends to be oh, let's uh, download it and say, oh, okay, but finally we have a model, as if it was a new model. And I, I know, and I have to admit that, that that maybe has something to do with the structure, and maybe has something to do sometimes for, with the police, this uh, command control. But they like very much models, don't they? People telling them what to do. <laughs> because that is also part of, of the profession as such. The danger then is, what kind of models do we give them? If we know that this is not working in other types of organization, or that it's much more nuanced, it's much more complicated, people are talking about the practice, people are talking about the context dependence and stuff like that, and even though we think it's a good idea to give it to the police, or another public organization, for that matter. 
And that is also part of that. And I will also, also relate this to the language that we're using related to new public management. Efficiency, for instance, to take one. Goal-oriented. Present, not presentation, um, um, performance. It's quite a different language, isn't it? And that is also, how does this relate back to Mars? How does this relate to what makes sense and how to develop from something in order then to, to uh, explore something, uh, something new? So that is also part of that. But what we do when we talk about leadership as practice is that Talk, don't stop talking about this heroic leader. I know it's, uh, it's uh, something that we have said for many, many years, but still it's there. And I also see when it comes to people talking about the, the future of the police, they say, that, okay, but the leadership will be important. But very often when they say that, they, at the same time they talk about the individual leader. And that is also important when we talk about this. Moving back from to what is happening in, in practice, but also acknowledging them, the complexity. We ha don't have an easy fix. And that is also important when it comes to, to the policing as such. They are the ones that actually will know what is good policing. Not the politician which has uh, gone on election because you want to be, to be popular, stuff like that, and you say something. The, the knowledge in the good policing has to be in the policing itself. And that is also is extremely important. And to, to wake you up even more, I'm not sure if I've waken you all, all the way up, but to wake you up even more to be a bit provocative. That as a researcher, as an academics, you have to stop talking to the police. They're so sick and tired of, of people telling them what to do in theory. What they want is something that actually will work, something that they can develop, something that makes sense. So actually, and that is so good when we're talking about the police, and now I have to relate it to the Norwegian police, but you have so many good people there that actually want to do as good work as they possibly can related to their police mission. And that is extremely motivating for, for us that is working together with them, but you have to, develop that confidence instead of saying, oh, but this, this doesn't uh, solve the purpose or this isn't the, uh, in according to this model or, or things like that. So if you look at the academic world, actually when it comes to the dualism between academia and practice, it has never been a larger uh, bridge. Do we talked about combining the two? A lot of the research in 19, 30, 1940, 1950, what's much more related to the practice. And now something is happening. And the problem then is, of course, don't talk to the police or others, if that, or that matter, in this kind of, of organization. And of course, it's very easy for me to say. That's the same as when you're talking about the balance between exploration and exploitation. It's very easy to say. So we have to then, of course, find answer in, in doing research and trying to go into the complexity because it's very complicated. So this is the, then the result of, uh, of, uh, of um, the, the shift of focus. This is the chief of, uh, of the Norwegian police, by the way, uh, Benedikte Bjørland. She wasn't police leader at the point of, uh, of the terror attack, but uh, she's been a police uh, leader now for four, four years, I think. She was the one going into the police force saying that, okay, but it's reform. We have to, to put the brakes up, brakes on. This is happening too many things too fast. And I like very much because I followed her also in my research. I followed her for one week. And that was after she started in the role, saying publicly also that we need to put the brakes on. And what I found is that when I, I followed in meetings, when people come with a lot of the ideas in the police directorate, she always holds it on to that, said that, okay, this is so small here in the police directorate, how big will it be out in the different police districts? And that is back to this change initiatives. What consequences will it have when you go out in the different practices? 
and how can this relate to, to the change that you want to, to have in the different uh, parts of, of, uh, of the police. Uh, the point also made when we talk, oh, sorry. The point also made when we look at the police reform and as a critic to the police reform, it's very much related to what I've been talking about so far um, with you guys, is that you have quite two different logic. And that is a huge challenge. It's related to, of course, if you're more top down or if you're more bottom, uh, bottom up. But what we also find in the Norwegian uh, police very much is this instrumental and struct uh, structural uh, uh, logic, which is very often related to the police directorate. And that is also very much, again, related to how they then try, at least, uh, initiative on the reform, but also how they try to implement the reform. Because what do you do if you have a very instrumental approach to change processes? You have very often cutter. <laughs> you have a starting point, and then you have the different phases. So you start with then try to exploring things, and then you start with creating, and then you start with uh, implementing, and then you start with the results. Not very much dynamic in that. Instead of taking on to, when we talk about change processes, taking on to these complexities, yeah, but this is the, also a dynamic process. What was happening here is that they found that this was a very good structure. This is going to happen first, then we will do this, then we will implement it on, on that level, and then we're finished. Evaluation. Good work, guys. So that is also, when you look at the innovation literature related to this practice-based approach, you will find the dynamic. You have to go back and forward, and you have to have a combination of of uh, the top down and bottom up. Because how can these guys at the top know what was going to happen when you start implementing these things? In different, 12 different police districts, 18,000 people all together. You have to have something that goes up and back and forward. And what is happening at the end is probably really not the same thing that you thought would be a good idea at, at the beginning. So that is also the dynamic that we need to have. And again, back to Mars. I love this guy, so uh, <laughs> you, you probably know that by now. But also related to, because what is meaning this instrumental and structural uh, logic is then the operational, the cultures in the police. What is happening there? Well, it's not by, um, by um, accident that they, they, these guys are running, because they were really running at the time of, of the reform. And they still, of course, are, because what they ended up with as a result of reform is that they have fewer resources. So a lot of these guys, when, we talk, when I talk with them on, on the reform, this, they say that, okay, they say that it's a reform to be more knowledge-based, to be more centralized, uh, to, in order then to get uh, more knowledge in, in, in relation to that, be more robust when it comes to knowledge in policing. But what th these guys would say is that, no, this is all, all about uh, saving money. That's what it is. And they saw that too, because they ended up with having fewer colleagues. So that is also, also part of, uh, part of this, uh, this, uh, this picture, so my, which I think is important. And related to that, if, if you should relate this to, to I, I think I'm over time now, <laughs> so I'll try, try to, uh, to, try to sum, sum up. But if we could relate this back to Aris and Schoen, single and double loop learning, what was happening with the Norwegian police? <clears throat> what the reform was all about was then more knowledge as contra-terrorism. For these guys, it was more like that you have to be prepared if something is happening. So very much of the reform was ending up with, yeah, but what if the same type of accident is happening again? And that will be. No one will go out to Utøya yeah, or, or take, take the bomb in the parliament building. Probably it will be happen in other places in, in Norway as well. But that is also the danger when we talk about these things, that you have an incident, which is, of course, 
extremely serious by all means, but then you reorganize uh, the police related to be better at this next time. And can I make another point as well related to that? Uh, I was thinking about that after the sessions that we had yesterday. Um, is this the same thing? I, I'm just asking you guys. Is this the same thing that we are doing when we think that now policing is, will be more offline, not online instead of frontline? Is this the same thing that we're doing? Because if we then think, of, okay, but we have a huge problem online and we put all our resources there, wouldn't the same thing happen when it comes to that it tends to be more single loop because they will probably be in need of policemen in the street or other kind of criminology. Or, or otherwise, they will probably develop and people, they, the criminals are quite smart. So if they figure out that, okay, the police, all the police are on, <laughs> online, so then we can figure out what is, what is when it comes to robbery, stuff like that. It's just, just a reflection that I wanted to, wanted to share with you. So what is, as a sum up, that is what uh, related to to uh, this final research when it comes to what we can think of as uh, practice dynamics in the police. And th this is, of course, not altogether positive, but this is what's related to the research that I did. And what I found is that when it comes to producing, of course, they are very much action-oriented. Action it's very much related to, to these uh, achievements, They're very much related to, to the task that they are supposed to solve when it comes to the producing. A huge amount of, um, of uh, taking care of each other, being there for each other, or as they say, as a saying that play each other good, I'm not sure if that function as good in, in Scottish uh, language, very much related to that because they have to take care of each other because they are out in the street, some of them, and they are emotionally also having to, to deal with a lot of this stuff. So that is a very good starting point, a lot of these things in how to, how to then to develop these practices, relate them to psychological safety, to relate them to the trust in the different, uh, different uh, practices. The humor, the stories, I've never heard so many nice stories and, and humorous stories in the police as in other organizations, much more in the police but also the sense-making and the negotiation that they do. The silos, how can we deal with that? Because that is also part of when we talk about uh, leadership at practice. We also have to find out a way to, to, uh, to decrease the boundaries between the different uh, practices. And I think that's, at least in Norway, that is probably a huge challenge, the silos within the different profession, especially when you go more off in the hierarchy. They're supposed to my leader is supposed to fight for me and our departments. That's what they do. That's why in every survey, the first, the, their, their closest leader is the rate very high. But the other leaders, this is a way of, of uh, that was very interesting when I, uh, if I can take, uh, take that story too, because what, what it was happening when, I, when they talk about leaders, the, their first line manager, or, the, or their closest leader, they, they wasn't really leaders. They liked them very much. They think they were really fighting for them. But the leaders, that was someone else, probably more higher up in the hierarchy, or it was someone in the police directorate, or it was something like, like, like that. So when they would complain about leaders, I had this uh, very much interesting talk with them, but who is leader now that you're complaining about? Now it was the chief of police. Yeah, and then someone started to complain again, and then, yeah, but then there was another leader. Yeah, that then was the police director in, the, in that district, but not the closest leader. And that is also very interesting when it comes to, which I find very interesting when it comes to police, because it can be quite different than in other types of, uh, of organization. So, and that is, uh, that is uh, the book. I will, I will, the timing was perfect, actually, when it comes to the police leadership as a practice when I was asked to hold this lecture. Because I, in February, end of February, I got this book out. This is a story about the Norwegian police, but also related to what I've talked about here. Uh, trying then, not as a new model, by God, no, 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 but as a way to go in and see how can we approach and understand leaders by thinking about it as a practice. So thank you so much for your attention.
Is that is that for me? Wow. This is your Nick Fife lecture. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Wow. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Coffee break before the next.